I converted this house into two flats. I want to go through what type of properties you can convert, how much it costs, how to get planning permission, and how much money you can make from this. So let's get started. So I bought this three bedroom terrace house in Stevenage. The property had two entrances. It had the main entrance and it had an entrance on the side. When you came in through the property, you had a kitchen on the left, stairs which went upstairs, a small toilet, and a relatively large living room. And then you had doors which led to the back garden. And when you came upstairs, you had a, a pretty small bedroom, a decent sized bedroom, and then you had the master bedroom. The plan was to turn this into two flats. So these are the plans we actually submitted we actually ended up making some changes to that. We had a separate entrance for the downstairs flat and a separate entrance for the flat upstairs. The downstairs one had access to the garden. The upstairs one was a flat with no garden space. What type of properties can you actually convert into two flat? If you're trying to maximize the profitability by turning a house into two flats, then ideally you want to find a terraced house which you can turn into flats, not semi-detached or detached. If I go into right move and put in Stevenage Station, click for sale, blue half a mile radius, a three bedroom house. Property type houses find properties under property types detached semi-detached and terraced so now if you look at this bottom one here this is a three bedroom terrace house it was sold for 325,000 pounds the one above it is three bedroom terrace house, but that is semi-detached and that was sold for 400,000 pounds. When it comes to turning houses into flats, the value of the flat is going to remain largely the same, whether it's in a terrace house or a semi-detached house, but it's costing you so much more to buy a semi-detached building. Then if you want to maximize your profit, you're better off buying a terrace house for 325,000 rather than a semi-detached for 400,000. So to maximize profitability, you're better off getting a terrace house rather than a semi-detached house. The next thing you want to make sure is you want to make sure that both the floors are 40 square meters. And this is because of the space standards. In order to get planning permission to turn a house into two flats, then a one bedroom flat which sleeps one person has to be at least 39 square meters. However, it can be 32 square meters where one person has a shower room rather than a bathroom. The floor area may be reduced from 39 square meters to 37 square meters. To turn a house into two flats, each of the floors has to be at least 37. The reason I say 40 is because sometimes you lose a bit of space because of communal area. Since the house only has one entrance, you're gonna lose a bit of area here in order to create an entrance for the downstairs flat and to create an entrance for the upstairs flat. That's from 40 square meters you come the safe side but the space for both of the flats has to be at least 37 square meters. This floor plan doesn't actually tell you how big it is unfortunately. Let's go on to this one here. See if this one tells you down here exactly how big the property is. The next requirement is for parking. In order to turn a house into two flats, assuming there are one bedroom flats, then each one bedroom flat has to supply one parking space. If it's two flats, then you need two parking spaces. This is the way it works in Stevenage Council, but I'm sure it works exactly the same in all the other councils as well. If you have a house which has one parking space, let's look at this. This is probably one parking space. Then if you submitted this house for planning permission, you actually will get planning permission rejected because the council will argue two flats need two parking spaces. The house only has one parking space and therefore you can't turn this house into two flats because you can't provide the second parking space. However, the house I converted into two flats, that doesn't have any parking whatsoever and that did get planning permission. You would think at least this one has one parking space. Surely that is better than the one which has no parking spaces. Typically a three bedroom terrace house or a semi detached house normally has two cars on average. So if a house doesn't have any parking, then those people most likely were parking on the road anyway. On the road, two spaces are occupied for that one house. And therefore, if I turn this house into two flats, then no more extra cars are being parked parked on that road outside the house since two were being parked anyway. It's weird logic, but if you want to get planning permission, and I'll go through this in a bit more detail later on, you either need a house which already has two parking spaces or a house which has no parking spaces. If you get a house with one parking space, you actually don't end up getting planning permission. The next thing you want is the stairs to be right at the front of the house because that way when you enter, you can create a door here and that goes straight up and you get into the upstairs flat and then you have another entrance here and you end up going into the downstairs flat. Sometimes what you get is you get properties where the stairs are not at the front of the house but they're somewhere in the middle of the house. That doesn't mean you can't convert the property into two flats but it will mean in order to maximize the space you'll have to relocate the stairs to the front of the house and that is an added expense. This is not a hard rule because sometimes it might be worth just moving those stairs and making it work but if you want to make your life easy and you don't want to spend that much money, then you're better off finding properties which have stairs at the front rather than in the middle or rather than at the back of the house. If you have two entrances, again, it doesn't make the conversion slightly easier, but again, it's not a necessity. You can simply just have one entrance and then create two entrances internally and just have one go upstairs and one downstairs. That is what I was going to do initially and then I changed my mind. Not a hard rule, but if you have two entrances, it can make it slightly easier. If you find a property which is a terrace house, 40 square meters upstairs, 40 square meters downstairs, has two parking spaces or no parking spaces, and 
logically has two front entrances, then that property is suitable to convert into two flats. But how much does that process cost in order to convert a house into two flats? So these are some of the legal costs on that project. In order to draw these plans up, that cost me £600. The cost to submit for planning permission was £487. Dean and Wilson, who are my solicitors, £500. The valuation fee to the broker, £720. I bought this property using a bridging loan. Depending on how you buy this property, you might have this cost or you might not have this cost. £1,440. Then I had another fee to the architect for £700. I think it was for the drawings for the building control, which I'll get onto later. Property insurance, £670. The architect building control fee, £400. Remortgage broker fee, £1,600. A lot of the costs are mixed up in there, ranging from the financing, solicitors, and actually planning permission. Those were the legal costs. Now, in terms of the cost of the services, we had a building control fee, more than £1,000. Soundproofing design, £360. Structural engineer advice, £200. Water efficiency calculations, £180. New electricity line, £3,000. SAP in EPC services, £430. Electric certificate, £400. Then of course you have the refurb itself. The two bathrooms cost me just under £3,000. The kitchens cost me £1,750 each. I had to buy the washer dryers and dishwashers, which were £1,100. The radiators or £900. The tiling for the two flats cost me £1,640. The sound insulation material, just under £3,000. The kitchen worktops, £850. I'm not gonna go through every single one. If you want an itemized list of all the money I spent across the entire project, then comment below and then I'll send you a link to this. If this seems like way too overwhelming and there's way too much going on, the first thing you can do is just find a builder who will essentially do everything for you. They'll do the building control, they'll buy everything, they'll do the sound insulation, they will do that for you. But the downside of that is that they're gonna charge you a premium because of course a lot of work is required in order to manage all those sort of things. The second way you can do this is by self-managing the works yourself. The benefit of that is that it's significantly cheaper. I think you can probably save about 50% of the cost. To give you an example, I said sound insulation here costs £2,839. When I got a quote for sound insulation by local companies, the quote was 11,000, 12,000, 13,000. Rather than paying the 12,000 pounds, I got a company in there who did a sound design survey, which was 400 pounds. And then in that survey, they tell you exactly all the materials you need in order to sound insulate. The materials cost about 2,800 pounds. I'm 400 pounds in, plus the 2,800, so that's 3,200. I literally just got my builder to drill everything into the ceiling. Eventually, we ended up passing the sound test and it cost me around 4,000 pounds rather than 12,000 pounds. That one example just shows you how much money you can save. Now, when it comes to buying things, like the kitchens, the bathrooms, the tiling, the radiators, the floors, if you sign up to LMPG and you buy two kitchens, you and all the other members are collectively buying a a lot of kitchens over the course of a year. LNPG might be buying a thousand kitchens from Magnet, and therefore you get a much better price. With Magnet Kitchens, using the LNPG membership, you get a 73% discount. You can get discounts on kitchens, on Johnston paint, all sorts of things just by signing up to LNPG. And that's what I did on this particular project. And that's why I've got this itemized list of every single thing, because I had to buy every single thing myself. The next thing you need is you need people on either day rates or someone who's just willing to do the labor and you buy everything and you get people to fit everything in. The total cost of the refer, which included the architect's drawings, the planning permission fees, splitting water, that came to 69,814 pounds, which seems like a lot. But like I said, if you get a builder to do that and you outsource the entire thing, it would be significantly more than that. If you think about it, each flat cost you about 35,000 pounds, which you know isn't that bad, given that you've stripped the entire building out and you've put two flats in there. That is how much it costs. But now how do you make sure that you get actually end up getting planning permission on these projects. These are some things you can do to make sure that you actually end up getting planning permission for this project. First thing you want to do is go into your council's website and search the development plan. With Stevenage, I'll search the Stevenage development plan. When you click onto this, then normally you'll have a document which says the local plan. This is the local plan in Stevenage from 2011 to 2031. The local plan is a plan which just sets out all the policies of that town or of that city how the council wants the area to develop, planning permission, rules, all those sort of things. There's normally a section which talks about what you can convert into flats. But there's a section called high quality homes. It might be under that section. And then I start going through it. Here we go. The conversion of a larger houses into smaller homes or flats or shared accommodation can be useful means of providing additional developing stock, which meets the small property demand. However, an increase in residents can result in need for additional parking and open space provision can increase traffic. You would have to go through this in a bit more detail, but essentially the development plan will outline to some degree what you can and what you can't do. I remember reading a development plan in one of the London councils. If you had houses which were smaller than 120 square meters, they would not get planning to be turned into flats because 
that council wanted to preserve medium-sized houses. However, if there was a house which was bigger than 150 square meters, so a very large house, then that would get planning permission because they recognize that there's not that much demand for very large houses. In your area, when you look for houses, then you make sure that the criteria fits based on development plan and you don't apply for things which are never gonna get planning permission in the first place. The second thing you can do is get a local planner in your area and you tell them, well, I'm looking to buy houses and convert them into two flats. Then you can ask them, is that something they've done before? If they've done that recently? And what sort of criteria do they recommend when it comes to getting planning? So the criteria I mentioned earlier in my area about either you have two parking spaces or you have no parking spaces, I actually got that from a planning consultant who had done similar applications before. If you can find someone who's done these projects before, then they know what gets planning permission and what doesn't. So you can work with them and refine the criteria even more. So you only look for properties which meets the criteria I went through earlier, and then you add their criteria on top of that. You end up with a pretty good list of things. When you're finding properties in Rightmove, you can check them off one by one, and if it meets, apply for planning. If it doesn't, then you don't. The final thing you can do is look at the planning portal in your area. If I Google Stevenage planning portal, find a planning application, then click search and view planning applications, and then just put in a postcode in your area. That will show you all the planning applications which have been submitted for that one particular postcode. You can go through this list and you can see if someone else has done something similar and if they got planning permission for this or if they didn't. With this property here, someone actually had planning permission literally two doors down to turn a house into two flats and a few years earlier, they actually got planning permission for that. When you're applying and you can see that someone else has done something very similar recently, then that gives you a very good indication because if they've got planning permission, then the chances are you'll also get planning permission. You want to make sure that they've got planning permission recently and not 15 years ago. Maybe 15 years ago, the development plan wasn't the same as what it is now and the policies could have changed. If I go through this postcode, you can see that this person applied for first floor side and rear extensions. So if you click into this, that will open up the planning permission and you can see when they applied and under decision, it says grant planning permission. If you're looking to do a first floor side and rear extension and you're two doors down from this house, then you have a pretty good indication that you will get planning permission for that particular conversion. If someone has applied for planning permission to turn a house into two flats, you can go into the planning documents and if you go through all the floor plans in the bottom corner, it tells you who the planner and the architect were who were working on that particular project. So you can just call up the same company and say, hey, you've done work set number 225, I own 223, I'm looking to do something similar. Could you help me get planning permission for this particular thing? That's one easy way of finding architects and planning agents just by looking at who else has done something similar. That is how you safeguard yourself from a planning point of view. Let's quickly talk about the other legal requirements when it comes to turning a house into two flats. The first main one is building regulations. The way to think about building regulations is it essentially determines if the property is safe to live in. Does the property have fire doors? Does it have sprinklers? Does it have smoke alarms? We're turning a house into two flats. One of the ones we had was that when you open the door for the flat which goes upstairs and you have stairs, then there has to be a distance between the front door and where the stairs begin because what you can't have is you open the front door and the stairs are way too close that it becomes a trip hazard and someone ends up falling over. So it's all these small things you have to make sure are in place to make the property habitable and to make the property safe. All you need is a building control inspector and you can find building control companies or you can just use the council's one. I'd recommend you use a private one. I would recommend you use a company who tells you what needs to be done and then you get your builder to do that. The next thing you need is soundproofing. Between the two flats, you have to make sure they're soundproof. The next thing you need is splitting utilities. With utilities, there's two ways of thinking about this. If you turn a house into two flats, but you keep them under one title, one piece of paper controls the entire property then you don't actually have to split utility. Then there can be one electric supply for the entire building, one gas supply, one water supply. Nothing has to be split individually for the two flats. However, if you split the title of the property into two properties, flat upstairs is, has its own title, the flat downstairs has its own title, then the utilities have to be split. This property already had gas. What we ended up doing was that downstairs, rather than splitting gas into two, downstairs we kept the gas, and then upstairs, rather than having gas, we just made everything all electric. When it came to the electric, we only had one supply, obviously, because it's one house. We then have to pay £3,000 to the electricity company to split the electricity. Really, the only thing you have to split is the electric. The benefit of splitting utilities is that you can split the title. You have two individual flats rather than one building which has two flats technically. And the reason that's better is because if you wanted to sell one of the flats, then that way you can sell one of the flats. If both the properties are on one title, you can't sell someone one of the flats because you know, the title has not been split. So ideally, you want to split the title. And for the sake of £3,000 of splitting electricity, and a few hundred pounds here and there, and a few hundred pounds legal cost, I can't see much benefit in keeping the entire property under one title. You've done all this stuff, which has taken a lot of time, has taken a lot of money, consumed a lot of energy. How much money does that actually make in the end? I bought the property for 265,000 pounds. The stamp duty came to 7,950. The refer, which included the planning permission, a lot of those other fees came to 
just under £70,000, and the legals came to £6,895. So the total cost of the project was £349,659. Once the property was converted into two flats, it was then revalued at £410,000. That made a profit of around £61,000 if I was to sell the property. However, rather than selling the property, I then refinanced the property. I ended up getting 75% of the 410,000 pounds. Now I haven't really drawn this to scale. Let's ignore this section here. 75% loan to value mortgage, which gave me 307,000 pounds back. Now, if you think about it, what's happened is, this property has cost me 349,000 pounds by legals, refurb, everything. Once the project has finished, the bank has given me 307,000 pounds of that back. I've spent this much and then I've got this much money back. Really, the only money this property has cost me is the difference between the two, which is this section here. Another way to put it is this is my money left in. This is how much money I've left into the project. And that came to just under 43,000 pounds. I've ended up with two flats for 43,000 pounds, which comes to about £21,500 each. Now let's work out the cash flow on this. The market rent for the two flats is around £1,950. The mortgage payments come to £767 for both the properties. I normally account for around a 10% maintenance buffer. Let's just say something breaks, you need a handyman. 10% of 1950 is £195. I self-manage all my properties. I don't pay any management costs. The building insurance comes to around £30 on this particular property. That leaves this section for the monthly cash flow. The profit comes to roughly £958 for both the properties on a monthly basis. To work out the return on investment for this entire project, which is how much money you're making divided by your total investment, this project is making £958 a month. If we multiply that by 12 for the entire year, that comes to 11496 And my money left in, my total investment is £43,000. If I divide 11,496 by 43,000, I end up with almost a 27% return on this project. Each of these flats is worth 205,000 pounds because the whole building is worth 410. And typically with 43,000 pounds, you can't even buy one flat worth 205,000 pounds, let alone two of them. By buying a house and turning into two flats, you can make a significant amount of money.